Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of fill in that a little bit just to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, I grew up here on the north side of Chicago and then out to the, the suburbs. I married into East Chicago, Indiana over 20 years ago and uh, um, and what I did there was I, uh, I tried to repurpose my skills uh, to address some of the uh, issues that East Chicago faced. I had been in um, uh, medical education. I had launched uh, a web uh, educational site for docs, uh, advancement in, in uh, medicine and also licensure. I received $17 million from the Washington Post to launch that. Uh, and this was in the early 19, or late 1990s. Uh, and then I moved back to East Chicago. We moved to New York to do that, and then moved back to East Chicago. And um, I looked to try to create kind of the vitals of East Chicago and to address those, and, I, and that's kind of how my thinking was. Uh, and I realized I didn't know enough uh, to address the, the um, land use issues that were, that were occurring there and how to repurpose those. So I went back to graduate school and studied urban planning, and that brought me uh, to where I, I, I think what I would call my baptism uh, in East Chicago and really got on the inside and got to know what was going on. Um, just a little additional back history. Uh, this exploration in East Chicago kind of brought me back into my own family's uh, uh, ancestry. Uh, my uh, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather was mayor of Chicago uh, during the Chicago fire. His name was Roswell B. Mason. Um, he had uh, was an engineer in the 19th century, worked on the Erie Canal, brought the Illinois Central to Chicago uh, in the 1850s. Uh, uh, um, if you know, when he, was, he became mayor in 1869. At that time, uh, Chicago had the most uh, international ports of call than any other uh, harbor in, in, in the country because they were expanding uh, west. And if you looked at a lot of his plans and, and stuff, what we do found back then in the 1840s and 1850s, uh, is you would get a description, maybe one third description of his project. Maybe it was a canal that he was going to look to link up uh, Lake Ontario to Lake Huron, Georgian Bay. And he would be describing uh, about one third in terms of how to accomplish that, the engineering uh, feats that needed to be need to occur. And then two-thirds of his documents uh, would be dedicated to all the geological surveys in the West. What were the resources to go exploit and go after? Um, that was where he focused on. And if you know back then, that land was not, that land was native indigenous land. Uh, and they had already characterized much of it, much of it, and were going towards that. And his he kind of saw himself as building that infrastructure. Um, he also was responsible for reversing the Chicago River. Uh, there's a lot of things in his history that I think we have to change. <laughs> I think we uh, uh, white settler colonies, colonizers uh, have a lot of these elements in our history and we have to look at how do we readdress uh, decolonization and how we re-address uh, uh, our own legacies. You, I, I found myself going to urban planning because that was an instinct, you know, maybe something I'd, I'd uh, uh, um, inherited from that, that moment. Now the other side of my family was working class. Uh, my father's side, uh, his dad uh, actually shoveled coal in the railroad that my mother's side built, her, her grandfather built. So that's kind of the, the dichotomy and kind of the, the, uh, the kind of, typical stories we have in Chicago. Anyhow, I'm going to give you a toxic tour of East Chicago. I'm going to really start with the culture of resistance. And one of the things about living in a community like East Chicago is you don't have a privilege to address a single issue. We're compound, we have so many cascading threats, so we have to hit a lot of issues. Uh, that's how I got involved with the, tar, uh, the uh, climate justice movement because that infrastructure is located in East Chicago. So I'm going to go a little bit real quick through climate justice um, campaign, what's happening with BP and the tar sands, and a little bit of what uh, are the major frameworks with climate uh, change. And then I'm going to get into EJ. So I basically, my history here for the last 10 years has been 
reintroducing environmental justice uh, to the climate justice movement. Uh, cl environmental justice had not been a framework that had been, op had been a very effective for the last 25, 30 years. But with the climate justice movement, we are beginning to get some uh, movement and, and being able to address some of that. And I'm going to show you, introduce you to some of those campaigns with a little bit of an introduction to East Chicago, the environmental context, and then the lead crisis that you probably may have heard of uh, what's happening right now in East Chicago. We got lead in the water, we got lead in the soils. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Marktown. So in terms of the, uh, uh, the resistance uh, culture, culture resistance, what we're looking at is reintroducing uh, ourselves to what happened in the 60s. And this is Gloria Richardson, and I think this helps frame uh, what's happening now in terms of uh, resistance movements that are growing around the country and the world. And uh, I'll read this real quick. A first-class citizen does not beg for freedom. A first-class citizen does not plead to the white power structure to give him something that the whites have no power to give or take away. Human rights are human rights, not white rights. And when it comes to the climate justice and environmental justice movement, it's the same thing when it comes to the air we breathe, the land we use, the water we drink, the biodiversity that we're a part of, and the future generations we uh, uh, hope to pass this, this planet on to. Uh, I think that's the same sediments. Uh, in the tar sands resistance movement, and I'm going to focus just specifically to tar sands within the climate justice movement, uh, because that's the infrastructure, the, the uh, supply chain that we have. Forgive me about the, the colors on, this, on the screen. It's, it is what it is. Um, there's a, a cadre of scientists, and I'll just focus on one scientist, James Hansen of the NASA uh, Goddard Institute, who's moved from um, a, a, a scientist giving, writing papers and submitting, uh, you know, intellectual uh, studies to, to journals and, and even to um, uh, the Congress. He first uh, uh, brought the attention of climate justice to Congress in 1988. And then there are whole other forms of resistance that have been uh, developing throughout the academies. Um, maybe not just within the, the climate science, not about uh, um, um, uh, whether it's sea level rise, whether it's ice in the Arctic or whatever. Uh, this is Thomas Homer Dixon. He's a, a professor over at Waterloo, Canada. His, his specialty is complexity and systems of complexity in our society and how we may need and how we, he believes we need to decomplexify, simplify. And we've, we've created uh, uh, a culture uh, that is overextending itself, that needs more energy to continue to supply this complexity that our, that our society is dependent on. Uh, I brought um, Guy McPherson up here about four years ago to speak. Uh, he's a uh, evolutionary biologist, evolutionary ecosystems is his specialty out of Arizona. He has a pretty dire interpretation on climate uh, science and climate change. Um, I'll just read his, this quote. Uh, the industrial economy is a subset of the environment, not the other way around. If we don't have a healthy biosphere, it doesn't matter how much money we have. Um, he really holds to this. He's really um, uh, internalized a lot, of, a lot of his own learning in terms of his own personal practice. And then what we're starting to see is the changing of narratives. Uh, Bill McKibbins, who founder of 350.com uh, or .org, uh, has been changing that narrative and what uh, he's, in, in, he's internalizing what James Hansen and other scientists are doing and has popularized uh, the movement, as, as well as uh, somebody like Naomi Klein with capitalism versus the climate. It's another popular uh, type of narrative to try to uh, show a, a uh, pathway forward uh, in how we need to adjust to uh, the changing climate and the other ramifications there are. In this, in this case, it's uh, capitalism. Uh, there are faith-based movements. You have the uh, uh, Pope Francis, which has finally spoken up in the Catholic Church, has retooled the Catholic Church over a billion uh, of the faithful. And is what was unusual about that when we heard about uh, Pope Francis' encyclical that was going to be coming out. We had expected that we would be wading through a lot of language that was unfamiliar with us, that we'd have to really work through it. And I'm speaking about those in the climate justice movement. But what it turned out is he adopted our language. 
Uh, so this was a very simple thing for us to understand. And he basically married uh, his his um, faith, uh, the faithful, to to this movement. Uh, there are other movements, uh, frontline communities that have been organizing. This is the Unitostan camp in British Columbia. Uh, they've been organizing against pipeline. They've never ceded their lands, and they're not letting the oil companies uh, run pipelines across their lands. Uh, and they're, they've been one of the first fighters, early fighters. I went up to uh, northern Alberta, to the University of Alberta, to speak in 2007, and got a chance to get a tour of the tar sands and meet. Uh, members of the Unitostan camp and stuff, and they're pretty disciplined in the forms that they take, uh, and they'll build uh, alternative energy infrastructure along on top of pipelines, proposed pipeline routes. There's a fellow named uh, Tim DeChristopher at the end of the uh, uh, Bush administration who was a college student in economics, a graduate student in economics, who uh, decided he would go to um, an auction of land leases or oil leases at the end of the Bush administration, which were illegally being sold off at really uh, uh, basement prices to the oil companies. And he bought up a bunch of those leases. Um, since that moment, uh, we changed over administrations, the Obama administration, the Obama administration declared the, uh, the auction illegal and, and voided it. Uh, but then pursued uh, Tim and uh, found him guilty, and he he uh, found himself in prison for two years. He founded uh, a group called Peaceful Uprising. Uh, when he came back, uh, came out of prison several years ago, he uh, he entered uh, the Harvard Divinity School, and he's been organizing through that. Uh, movements that have been uh, picking up on what's happened in uh, North uh, in Canada. Uh, you know, with the uh, First Nations here down in the fit lower 58 or 50 states or 48 is idle no more. Uh, they've started to organize uh, and we've been seeing a lot of their activities and also uh, different campaigns that they've been doing. Uh, there's a group out in uh, Nebraska called Bold Nebraska that started organizing against the Keystone Pipeline that was proposed that we fought for many, many years under the Obama administration. And they used the same tactic that the Unitostan camp did. They put uh, uh, alternative energy infrastructure uh, on top of the proposed route of the Keystone Pipeline, in essence trying to uh, you know, tempt them to tear this out to build the Keystone. This is, this is a community center that was built. And then on the southeast side, we started seeing petroleum coke uh, forming big, big piles and uh, the south, Southeast Side Coalition against Pet Coke started organizing against that. And that's again part of the supply chain of the oil industry and in the, in the end, what we're seeing right now is that we're at the end stages of this fossil fuel era and down on the Southeast Side we're doubling down on tar sands. Uh, we brought uh, people like uh, uh, Reverend Billy uh, and the Stop Shop Gospel Choir down to BP in East Chicago. Uh, if you don't know Reverend Billy, he's kind of like the um, uh, the Stephen Colbert of preachers. He, he, he came down and performed an exorcism of BP. It was really quite a spectacular moment. Lots of testimonies, uh, lots of music. It was really very, very uh, exceptional. He's also uh, cour enormously courageous. Just went and marched right onto their land and, uh, and tried to perform this exorcism. Uh, we have had a lot of art projects, uh, campaigns, and uh, art shows. This was one that we had about four or five years ago uh, called Pipe, uh, Pipelines and Borderlines, uh, People Can't Drink Oil. What we did is we uh, asked, uh, did a call for art of artists that live along the pipelines. And uh, these were prints. And so they did, they, they had an art show. We had this down at Paul Henry's in Hammond, Indiana. Recently in the band Petco Coalition, we had another show that we had up at the uh, uh, Contemporary Museum of Photography at. Uh, uh, Columbia College uh, that addressed the pet coat problems. Right now that that show has been brought down to the southeast side. It's at Sky Art. You can go down there and see that. Uh, some other forms of resistance that we've seen that's been classic ones uh, are, you know, this is uh, uh, Chris Wama for the My Cats, the Michigan Coalition Against Tar Sands. And if you remember in 2010, uh, one of the pipelines, the Line 6B, uh, broke in uh, the Kalamazoo River, uh, uh, spilling about a million gallons. 
Uh, Enbridge was the company that owned that, and I'll explain a little bit about that history. But t uh, Chris Walmoff, uh, as they were expanding that network of pipelines, um, Chris Walmoff took a skateboard and spent his day in the pipe. Uh, forcing them to shut down work for the day and and then and, and trying to get them out. We've seen lots of uh, actions like that: locking down on equipment, sitting in trees, uh, blocking uh, um, structures. And so we've taken these campaigns and we brought them to marches and to uh, testimonies in various places, whether it's D.C., New York, uh, Minneapolis, is where a lot of this infrastructure is com coming out of. Uh, we've expanded the campaign uh, and tried to show symbolic force with mar large marches. This was in New York where we got 400,000 people to march. Uh, oh, here's Reverend Billy again. Uh, we brought the campaign here to East Chicago and Whiting, Indiana at the BP refinery. We got about 1,500 people to come. Last May, a year ago from today, we had Bill McKibbins, Tara Huska, who's uh, with Honor the Earth and also the uh, indigenous liaison to the Bernie Sanders campaign. We brought uh, Malik Youssef, who's a five-time award-winning uh, uh, musician with the Hip Hop Caucus. Uh, we brought Claire McClinton from Flint, uh, from uh, the Flint uh, Defenders League, and, and several other uh, speakers from environmental justice. And about 41 people uh, uh, got arrested shutting down sitting in front of the the gates at BP we actually trained about 200 people that were ready to sit and get arrested that day uh, but we scared the hell out of them uh, the night before because we were going down to Indiana we just had not done an action yet in Indiana and we didn't know how the police were going to respond uh, and they, they responded quite strongly and in force uh, we've recently had the uh, uh, um, the No Dapple campaign, Standing Rock, in North Dakota. Uh, and that was where we where lots of uh, indigenous communities and allies had, had gone and occupied land uh, at Standing Rock. Um, that was a campaign that uh, actually uh, started almost, almost a year ago. Um, about in April last year, we had about three or four uh, indigenous people uh, start a camp at Standing Rock. They came uh, down to Chicago, uh, five of them, uh, when Bernie Sanders dropped out, and uh, we had discussions on what we can do next. Remember at the, um, um, what was it, the People's Summit? I can't remember it was last year at this time. And so we had those discussions then and how we can escalate. They had already lost a lot of the, uh, the campaign in terms of uh, permitting and stuff. And so that was, they were way behind the eight ball, ball and we were trying to figure out what we can do to escalate the situation. And so at that time, we defined that a thousand people, if we can get a thousand people to North Dakota, we can change the storyline. Uh, we got 10,000, we got nations, we got 500 uh, tribal nations to come from all over the world. It became a much bigger thing than we could ever have imagined. Uh, First Nations really took it over. And then this was just this last, uh, just a few weeks ago uh, at, in D.C. where people from East Chicago, Northwest Indiana for the first time really started getting involved, uh, where we brought about 200,000 people uh, on Trump's 100th day in office. Um, so th so th that's, that's just some of the movements that are doing and the people that are involved. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a story on climate change, some of the very basics you know, we understanding about what climate change is and what, what we mean by it. For the most of the last uh, 10 million years, we've, been, we've had an atmosphere that held about 240 or 280 uh, parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. That's, that's the era that we evolved in and where we're very comfortable with. Uh, it is in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, scientists have determined that uh, the upper limit of a safe zone of carbon in the atmosphere was about 350 uh, parts per million, hence the reason why we have the, the, the organization 350.org. Uh, but today we're at 410 uh, parts per million. We're way above that. and We're in a situation that um, can trigger a lot of um, nonlinear feedbacks, uh, chaos, uh, when we think about the complex society that we have, we think about nonlinear collapses uh, that may happen in different places. 
so that's where we're at. We're trying to pull it back down to 350 uh, parts per million. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but basically right now what we're actually at is we're trying to keep the global temperatures down below 2 degrees Celsius increase. Uh, we don't want to increase above that. Uh, right now, it, business as usual would bring it at uh, 4.5 uh, degrees Celsius. That would be in an extreme range uh, of chaos. But this is what I think is most significant and when, when, uh, and, and in terms of the ramifications. Um, when Bill Clinton, when we, we crossed over the millennium into, into year 2000, uh, Bill Clinton predicted that children born in the year 2000 would most likely uh, live to the year 2100. Uh, based on the advances in medicine. Now, just less than 17 years later, we're now revising that back 20 to 40 percent. We're actually seeing life expectancy beginning to decrease. Experts now in different fields are now triaging. Uh, what populations, what regions are we gonna save? Today, uh, every single day, uh, 150 species go extinct uh, due to climate change. Uh, we're seeing the erosions of our coasts we know that by 2036, um, that Miami's gone. Miami's gonna be dis gonna disappear. Much of the coast is gonna go. Perhaps DC and perhaps Chicago will become the next capital of the country. Uh, but we're, these are the types of things that we're discussing now, what we're gonna save, what species, what peoples, what, uh, what regions are we gonna save. We know that the Maldives are probably gone. We know that, um, 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 other regions are going to go. When, when, when these countries in the Philippines go underwater, uh, they're not going to go quietly. They need to be, they need, we're going to see lots of climate refugees. We're going to see them in, in the United States from the coast. They're going to be trying to come to the Great Lakes region, uh, most probably, and further north. Um, so there are lots of ramifications in terms of how we're going to organize our society in a in an attempt to manage collapse, and collapse where we don't know where they're going to, where collapses are going to occur. Um, and so now I'm going to move to the framework of East Chicago and how we fit into that big story and why we need to juggle with these big, big issues. Uh, about three years ago, BP uh, went online with a brand new uh, tar sands oil refinery um, in a, a one of the poorest communities in the country uh, East, of East Chicago. They actually, it's known as the uh, Whiting Refinery, and they actually moved this refinery out of Whiting uh, into East Chicago. It's a $4.5 billion project, the largest private investment in Indiana's history. They weren't gonna stop something like this. And uh, the poor people of East Chicago, one of the poorest, uh, again, communities in the country, awarded BP $165 million in tax incentives to build it in their community and to build it right across the street from a national historic district, a workers village. You know, in Pullman on the southeast side of Chicago is a Utopian's workers village. There is Marktown in East Chicago, and we also have Sunnyside. Um, so you remember just recently with the Trump administration saying in his campaign, we're gonna build that wall, we're gonna make uh, Mexico pay for it. In a sense, we've already been doing that. BP building this tar sands refinery, making the residents of East Chicago pay for some of the poorest people, uh, contributed much to that. So, give you a little bit of uh, the existing conditions. Being an urban planner, I tend to focus on existing conditions. Uh, BP sits on the lake sh on the southern shores of Lake Michigan on a foot with a footprint of 1,400 uh, acres. To give you an understanding of the size of that, it's very similar to the Loop in downtown Chicago. Um, it's been producing uh, about 2.2 million tons of petroleum coke. That's a byproduct every single year. That's what was being found on the southeast side on the, on the shores of the Calumet River that triggered the Ban Pet Coke Coalition to go after that. Uh, the, the Coke brothers on the southeast side were storing that there and it started to blow, blow around in the neighborhood and causing lots of problems. Uh, and and uh, residents having to go in and not to go outside and have activities. And it was a photograph like this that was spread on the internet and Facebook that really triggered a campaign to shut down these facilities. Um, BP went online with their new oil refinery in 2014, and a month after they went online, they were already spilling in a major way into Lake Michigan with tar sands oil. Um, 
they spilled about 1,600 gallons um, in March of 2014. And then not, not much long after that, about a year after that, uh, they had a major uh, uh, strike. Uh, res uh, workers in the BP refining, about 1,800 uh, full-time workers, went on strike based on, on safety issues in the facility. Um, and also their concerns with faith, safety in uh, the community. But during that strike, there were lots of malfunctions going on because they were still going online with this brand new refinery. So we had oil spills, uh, we had explosions, uh, and, and, and things like that that were occurring almost on a continuous basis and to this day are, are continuing to happen. Now, to kind of give you a framework of what we did and where BP is and how that fits in, into our stories of climate change, um, what, what's happened in 2002, we shifted off of light sweet crude into what's called heavy sour crude. That sour means so, uh, sulfur. And we moved our reliance out of, the Saudi, out of Saudi Arabia and onto the tar sands in northern Alberta. And the, in a project area close to the size of Florida. So, to give you kind of an understanding of this, this is in northern Alberta. It's the largest engineering project in human history. It's larger than the Three Gorges Dam. It's larger than the Panama Canal. And it's happening on our continent. And it's also happening in the ancient boreal forest. And the significance of that is the ancient boreal forest rings around the, the globe in the northern hemisphere. And that's uh, the largest carbon sink on the planet. So it draws the carbon out of the atmosphere and deposits it down into the peat underneath the forest. Um, and what going after that oil, that what we're calling tar sands, going after the oil that's in the sands in that peat, is they have to tear down the arboreal forest. So now, about three years ago, uh, that project is now the largest deforestation project on the planet. It's no longer the Amazon, although the Amazon is still going the way it is. Now we're doubling down with additional deforestation projects. So what you're seeing on the left here is uh, the ancient boreal forest as we know it, and what you're seeing on the right is called productive use. This is what we're going for. This is what we're priding ourselves after, um, is, is the scorching of the earth up in the ancient boreal forest. And this is, these are the project areas. And to give you kind of an understanding, there are these dots on the street there. I should have had another slide to show you how large those dots are, actually. Those are, those are the largest vehicles that man has ever made. They're three stories tall and they are dump trucks filled with tar sands. Uh, and on, this, on the scale of this photo, they just look like dots. Uh, and what they have to do, once they dig that up, is they have to boil out the oil out of the material, out of the sands. And in so doing, they're creating these massive to uh, toxic tailing pots. So they're so large that right now, and actually in 2014, they, one of these tailing, or you, or you, the aggregate of all those tailing ponds are the size of Lake Erie, one foot deep. And these are very toxic ponds that they are creating. There was a, uh, a UN group that came up there because they heard about the toxic ponds. And as they were there, uh, a, fly, uh, 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 a group of uh, geese uh, landed in the ponds and immediately died. So they have, these, they have rigged all of these um, um, scarecrow type figures and noises to try to scare these birds off from landing into the toxic waters. That, or, that yellow pile there, that's sulfur that's, that's been piling up. That's, mat, that's about five stories tall. We're also seeing piles of sulfur piling up on the shores of the Calumet River here in Chicago. And this is what they're going for, the uh, bitumen. Uh, this is like a tar-like substance that we're digging out of the ground, and they need to get it down here to the refineries in the Midwest. Uh, and the way in which they're looking to do this is they're looking to, they have to slurry it and thin it to be able to put it in the pipelines and send it down to, to the refineries here. There are 25 refineries in the Midwest. And so what they're doing is they're taking some of the condensate or this lighter uh, crude, synthetic crude perhaps, that's coming out of the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota and piping it up to the, the tar sands to slur it in so they can pipe it down here to the U.S. So there's a huge network of pipelines and this doesn't even do, do justice to it. It just gives you a, a basic framework of what's going on. And to, to what they're doing also when they're building these pipelines is they 
the normal pipe for conventional crude is about 110 uh, pounds per square inch. That's the pressure that they put on it. To, to put tar sands through pipe, they have to increase that pressure uh, to 1,200 pounds per square inch. So the major pipelines that we're, we're, we're uh, most concerned with and is that we fought for a long time was the Keystone uh, pipeline that we've, we uh, had been fairly um, successful under the Obama administration in, in fighting. But under the new Trump, Trump administration, um, we, it's almost inevitable that it's going to be approved. Now, the pipeline's approved. What hasn't been approved is the crossing of the border from Canada to the U.S. And that's what uh, Obama um, did not approve. And for the first time that we got when he, in that approval process and the rejection of that pipeline, is we had the language of climate change. So that was a significant a success of that, uh, that disapproving of it. So that proposed pipeline is about 900,000 barrels per day that's proposed to come down. And basically it's looking to cross the, uh, the U.S. and get to the, the coast so that it can go to the international markets. It's looking to bypass all the refineries in the Midwest. But while everybody for four, five, six years are focusing on uh, the Keystone, which was TransCanada, a Canadian company, there was this other malicious little company at the time uh, growing very quickly called Enbridge, and they were building a network right through the Chicagoland area, nearly five times larger than the Keystone pipeline. And Enbridge um, was, has been focused, one of the major focuses of the Enbridge uh, campaigns has been the Alberta Clipper. They expanded the Alberta Clipper, and they brought it across. They came. In, they brought it to the to the um, uh, to the uh, northern borders of the U.S. And they were looking to get approvals from Obama for that. And unfortunately, they couldn't because they, they they didn't expect to get it uh, because Obama had already disapproved one. So what they ended up doing is they did what was called a switcheroo. They ended up switching it over to an old pipeline that was 60 years old called Line 3. They came to the border, switched it over to Line 3, and then proceeded to go across the border. The reason they were able to do that is Line 3 does not have any limits on capacity. So they're able to, to put it on an old pipeline that was approved you know, six dec decades ago without any limits. Now we know that we, we, we have lawsuits and campaigns against that. We know we're going to lose those under under Trump. So that campaign's basically gone in trying to fight the switcheroo. So they have the Alberta Clipper and they have line three that they that they are bringing down through. And these are really the trunk lines. The idea back then uh, was that we were looking to fight that, you know, squeeze it at the spigot and have it would have limits on all the downstream uh, pipelines that could be built. So there's the lakehead system that runs through here. Now I'm just going to highlight two pipelines. You, all right, remember the, the Keystone, right? That was 900,000 barrels a day, eight to 900,000 barrels a day. And we also know from historic, uh, this past year, we've been fighting the, the, the Dakota Access, which is about 400,000 barrels per day. Uh, so while we're fighting that, and we've lost, the, and apparently we're losing that, uh, Enbridge has been building this network through here, again, five point, uh, or 2.5 million barrels a day of, of pipelines, and that includes line 61 and line 14. Uh, line 6A is another one, and that's, to, un to give you an understanding of that, that is about the same size as the Keystone plus the Dakota Access that runs through here, through this region. Uh, a significant campaign that we're, we're really uh, looking to really ramp up, we've been working on for the last, uh, last couple of years, is Line 5. It goes over Lake Michigan, and then it goes through the Mackinac Straits to get over to Sarnia, uh, Ontario. Um, that's a 60-year-old pipeline that's having lots of problems. We've sent by di divers down to take a look at it, and the sports have been broken. It's starting to peel off. And again, they want to repurpose this for tar sands, which means they have to increase the, the pressure in it. We're, we've mapped out, we've modeled out uh, uh, disaster scenarios, and it does not look good. So we're looking for a moratorium on this pipeline and also looking to have a moratorium on all pipelines running through the Great Lakes region. Um, there's Line 6B. The reason why Line 6B is significant, as I mentioned before, that's the line that broke through the Kalamazoo, in the Kalamazoo River that spilled uh, nearly a billion or million gallons. That uh, was in 2010, the same time that BP had spilled in the Gulf, so many people didn't know much about it. 
uh, give you a little bit of quick history on it. Um, it spilled one night, it broke one night in the Kalamazoo. The technicians up in Alberta noticed the pressure going down, and so instead of responding by sending somebody out to take a, take a visual, they decided just to increase the pressure. So they increased the pressure three times over 17 hours until somebody spotted that there was a problem on, on the ground and, to, and forced them to stop it. Now this is a pipeline that they deferred maintenance for over 10 years. And uh, so it, it became a huge, huge problem. Enbridge uh, eventually uh, came in, spent over $1.2 billion to clean it up, but has not completely cleaned it up at all. Now tar sands, one of the things that also happened there is unlike conventional crude, which you put out booms, you know, race in there, the first responders, you put out booms, and you collect it, right? Because it, it float, oil floats. But tar sands doesn't operate that way. What ended up happening is the tar sands actually sunk to the ground, to the bottom of the, of the, of the waterway, and the, and the condensate volatilized off. So many of the first responders got, uh, got a huge breath of, of some really toxic stuff, and people have been, been getting very, very ill. So what you saw in the Gulf where the uh, uh, first responders were cleaning animals and saving them, you weren't seeing that here in the Kalamazoo. You actually weren't seeing many images at all, because what they were doing is Enbridge was racing into the area just to cordon off the whole area and buy up all the property and to separate us from what was happening. The, the, this is one of the first times that we had a tar sand spill, and it was a major spill. And so it op, we've, many of the first responders were, again, uh, not knowing that it was tar sands, not knowing how to uh, respond, and then responding as if it was conventional crude, and then putting themselves in harm's way. We had the Mayflower <coughs> spill in uh, 2012, or 13, down in Arkansas. Uh, again, this is a, a tar sand spill where they ended up buying up all the property uh, because of the, the toxicity of the, of the spill. Now the other way in which they're trying to build capacity in what we're calling bomb trains uh, is they're putting it on rail. If they can't build enough pipelines fast enough to have been putting it on rail. The problem that we're discovering, especially with the, the, the materials coming out of, or the product coming out of the Balkans, is that it's highly unstable. Uh, if the temperature changes uh, more than uh, 24 degrees in a 48 hour uh, uh, span, it is, and it, if ignition is available to it, it can explode. And so we've had a series of massive explosions. This was in Lac Magentic in 2013, where it exploded right in the city center, killing 70 people uh, that night, or 47 people that night. Completely wiped out the downtown region. We had another explosion just two, three years ago on, on, uh, near Galena, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. So these are really dangerous things that we're seeing. And we're, there's, there's, a, there's a temptation uh, to solve the problem but for the industry and to build solutions and to build better uh, uh, railroad cars uh, to hold this. Um, and it comes to a term that I've, I've, that I've kind of feel like I kind of coined, um, is I, I call it a risk, I'm sorry, a worth rigor error. And the idea is if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. We do a lot of worthless things very well. Academics, engineers, um, bureaucrats tend to do a lot of worthless things very, very well. And I think building out solutions for this type of uh, energy source I think is a worthless project. Um, they're also proposing to make as we already know, the Great Lakes are considered Highway H2O, looking to make it Highway H2 oil. You can see the India Ever Shipping Canal in there, looking to get to the BP refinery. Again, this is where all the uh, uh, tar sands refineries in the Midwest are located, uh, the largest of which is the BP refinery on the shores of Lake Michigan in, in East Chicago. I'm going to skip over this, but in our campaigns, we're, we, it's really very important that we look to uh, solutions that are uh, in the social justice framework and what we've been arguing for is a just transition to a low carbon economy and this is just some sort of uh, uh, bullet points of some of the things that we've put on the table that we're working trying to work towards um, we're really the main thing here is we're looking for capital to bear the burden of these these last uh, this last century uh, and not place those burdens on people and, and work and the workforce 
All right, so here's East Chicago on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. If you ever get a chance to look at Google Earth or look at a map, you'll see that East Chicago has probably the most distinctive uh, geological uh, feature, and that's this peninsula that goes out to Lake Michigan. This has been built off of the steel uh, waste uh, for the last 100 years that they built out into Lake Michigan, and then they built their uh, um, uh, facilities on top of. Now, just to give you kind of quick understanding of some of the quick history is, this isn't what I would call industrial fiefdoms on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. You had Whiting uh, Standard Oil founded in Whiting, Indiana in 1889. That significance of that is three years before the Rockefellers founded the University of Chicago. Uh, it's the same as the Rockefeller uh, family. And East Chicago was founded in 1893, the same year Inland Steel. Uh, uh, came to East Chicago, and then Gary was founded in 1906 with U.S. Steel coming to, the, to there. And for most of the 20th century, up until close to the 70s, these were paternal relationships that, that the community had with industry. The fortunes of industry and the fortune of the community kind of went hand in hand. The last 40 years we've seen a decoupling of that, uh, of those fortunes. Industry has gone on to globalize uh, and uh, the communities have seen a, a vast uh, uh, depletion of, the, of its employment base. I'll give you kind of a quick un understanding. In the 1970s, East Chicago employed over 70,000 people, employees, uh, workers in steel and steel-related industries. Today, we employ less than 2,500. Steel production is still way up. People kind of have this understanding that steel has disappeared because it's left Chicago in the southeast side. Chicago uh, shut down most of its steel refineries 40 years ago. Uh, and now it's more, Chicago shifted away from an industrial economy towards an information economy. What we've seen on the Indiana side, is we've seen a reindustrialization uh, occurring, especially in the last five, six years. So the southern shores of Lake Michigan are still one of the most, uh, most productive regions in the world for steel uh, manufacturing. Um, East Chicago, for most of the 20th century, identified itself as the most industrial city in the world. And it most closely probably was, very, very closely. We're only 12 square miles. Uh, the mythology, the, the, the metaphors that they, they carried with them through this era, and it was a, you know, the idea was smoke meant jobs, and this kind of gives you an understanding. This is from uh, what's called the Indiana Days, a celebration in 1908 in, in the Indiana Harbor of East Chicago. Um, the skies are often dreary and the air is filled with smoke in northwest Indiana from the gas and the coal and the coke. But we wouldn't be without it for it's the way in which we grow in northwest Indiana is where the furnace fires glow. And that really gives you an understanding. This, this is a, a, a uh, poster from the South Shore line. Gives you, uh, also kind of doubles down on that mythology, that metaphor that smoke means jobs. East Chicago and the southern shores of Lake Michigan, the southeast side. Uh, of uh, Chicago and Gary all saw themselves as the workshop of America. What we've done to this population, the workforce of America, is that we shifted that metaphor. That, that smoke no longer means jobs. Much of it means now uh, is poison. You know, smoke means poison. It means industries are externalizing uh, their costs into the, into the air, water, land, and into our tissues and, bio, and the biodiversity. Uh, a quick understanding of East Chicago and the political framework, you have about 7.1 million people on the, on the Chicago side in the Chicago metropolitan area. That's more than the entire population of Indiana, which we have a population of 6.7 million people. We are literally a, uh, what I would call an industrial colony of Chicago. Pushed out a lot of the, the elements that, you, that are least desirable into another political uh, jurisdiction and away uh, from Chicago. The other really significant thing to understand is where this is occurring on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. This is the fourth, or for most of the 20th century, was the fourth most biodiverse region on the continent. This is where uh, the ecosystems of the northeast, northwest, and the southeast all kind of come together uh, on the southern shores of Lake Michigan with the Indiana Dunes. You had the receding of the, of the glacier activities that created these micro-ecosystems and juxtapositions of ecosystems. You've got an enormous amount of variety of cacti and, and orchids. I think it's the most, uh, more variety of orchids there than any other place. 
But we've lost biodiversity at a tremendous rate in the last 10 years. We're no longer, although I have this as the fourth, we're no longer the fourth. We're the seventh most biodiverse region now. And that's, um, that's occurred in the last decade. And to kind of understand this is two thirds of our lakefront is a gated industrial community. You can see East Chicago with that peninsula. And in fact, to kind of understand, to go back to the uh, political framework, um, in the 1950s, uh, there was a proposal to take over the entire southern shores of Lake Michigan for steel production. It took, uh, it, it, Indiana did not fight that. It actually took a congressman from Illinois, Congressman Douglas, Douglas to stop that activity and to negotiate terms to save the dunes in Indiana. So now we have the Dunes uh, National Park, uh, National Shoreline. That would not have happened but for the power in, in, in Illinois and understanding why we needed to, do, to uh, preserve that. Also kind of understand, um, in 1906 when, East, when they built uh, the steel mills in the southern shores of Lake Michigan and Gary, what they ended up doing is plowing down those uh, dunes. And that is how you raise the, the city of Chicago and the streets of Chicago eight feet. Remember in the, around that, the turn of this last century? They, all the mud and the problems that you had with flooding uh, in Chicago, downtown Chicago, most of that came from the dunes in Gary. That also occurred again in, in the 1950s and 60s when they negotiated terms for saving the dunes and they created portage uh, and the Bethlehem steel and also uh, inland steel that moved out there. Uh, they plowed down those dunes and they, they barged those soils or those sands up to uh, Northwestern so Northwestern can expand into Lake Michigan. So to see the southern shores of Lake Michigan, everything you see in blue on this is infilled uh, by slag and steel waste. Uh, we built our neighborhoods on top of this slag and steel waste. The light blue brown that you see there is fly ash. Some of our neighborhoods actually are built on fly ash. Um, you can see this vast area of slag. In, all the way through this area, you would have seen uh, dunes in swale and, and, and dunes as high as 20 feet uh, previously. All right, so I'm gonna go a little bit more statistics and uh, give you more another context. When it comes to the water, our waterways, Indiana, and there's a reason why these industries have um, thrived in Indiana and why they haven't thrived in, in Illinois and why they've been pushed out. Indiana discharges 30% more, uh, actually 33% more industrial waste into its waterways than any other state in the Union. The second worst offender is Virginia. We, we discharge over 27 million pounds of known toxins into our waterways annually. Illinois discharges uh, around 8.8 .8 million. And what that correlates to is our beaches in Indiana are often the most contaminated. George Beach is in East Chicago. It's the most contaminated beach in the Great Lakes and third most in the country. Uh, when it comes to our air shed, give you an understanding, and this is based on what we call TRIs, Toxic Release Inventories. These are self-reporting in, uh, inventories by industry. I don't know how many people realize that they have this, uh, this understanding that the EPA regulates and, and then monitors these industries. And that's not the case, they actually self-report. So based on TRIs, um, Lake County, Indiana, where East Chicago is located, is generally ranks in the top 10 for industrial discharges into its atmosphere. Um, give you kind of an understanding, there are 3,143 counties in America. We rank in the top 10. Now, that doesn't leave us alone. There's a lot of other bad players, bad areas to go to. But what's significant for Chicago in this, not just East Chicago, but is that a lot of, we have the Northeasterlies that bring all this toxic, uh, um, uh, plumes in the atmosphere over Lake Michigan. The Northeast Lilies blow that over Lake Michigan and then it gets blown over to Chicago, which makes Arsenal, U.S. Steel, and, and uh, BP some of the largest contributors to industrial pollutants in Chicago's air shed as well. And so this is, from my point of view, this is the most important slide uh, and why we ended up where we are is in how we allocate our resources. The ABA, the American Bar Association, identifies there are 30,000, this is from 2012, 30,000 environmental attorneys uh, employed full-time in the United States. Nearly uh, 28,000 of them are employed full-time by industries and corporations. 
Less than 2,000 of them are employed full-time by government agencies. That's at the federal, state, and local levels. And then less than 600 are employed full-time by nonprofits. Uh, and of course, nature doesn't employ any attorney full-time. From my point of view, we have to flip this over entirely. We're allocating our resources into the wrong place. It's kind of thinking about water. We're, we're, we're privileging water to industries over people. And uh, water, obviously, I think, uh, is, should be considered a human right. But the way in which we allocate those resources don't, don't uh, reflect those values. Uh, here's a map of East Chicago. Being an urban planner, I love mapping things out. 80% of East Chicago is zoned industrial. That's everything in purple. Uh, less than 17% of East Chicago is zoned residential. Here's an environmental uh, uh, inventory uh, and of quality issues, whether it's uh, the quality of the land uh, or leaking uh, storage tanks. Uh, we know there are, 40, uh, there are 84 underground storage tanks. Of those 84, 33 of them are known to be leaking uh, in East Chicago. Um, this is another map of East Chicago in the upper left-hand corner. What you're seeing are um, uh, mapping out of plumes under the ground. Uh, this is where the BP refinery is located. In 1991, we identified that there were 16.8 million <coughs> gallons of oil floating on our water table. Uh, it started to actually bubble up into the, into the homes uh, of the adjacent neighborhoods around two, uh, 1991, and in fact, the residents sued BP, at that time it was uh, Amico, sued them, uh, but they lost their suit because they couldn't prove it was their oil, uh, because they, they claimed that there were other uh, legacy contaminants. Now, when you buy an oil company, you take on those, those liabilities. Uh, it's just an, a close-up view of this. As you can see, they've only monitored on the industrial parcels. They have not monitored uh, everything in yellow here is the neighborhoods. Uh, they have not completed those tests to see how far these plumes go. They haven't even completed the tests on industrial properties, which is in gray here. So here's the Indiana Shipping Canal. I told you I used to be the director of the Indiana Shipping Canal. For most of the 20th century, that was considered the most polluted body of water in America and perhaps the world. Uh, now it's where we identify the Ohio River. Uh, there is a dredging project for navigational purposes of the canal that's just begun. I kind of remember uh, when the Clean Water Act uh, uh, was finalized in 2000, or 1972, we thought we solved a lot of problems. We had the Cuyahoga River burning up in flames, and we thought this was going to solve it. What ended up happening here in this scenario was prior to two, uh, 19, uh, 1972, the Army Corps would come in and they have jurisdiction for navigational purpose. They would, they would dredge it every other year and they would take those sediments and they, they'd plop them in the middle of Lake Michigan, you know, randomly where they wanted. What the Clean Water Act uh, did is it stopped them from doing that. So for over 40 years, there, has never, there hadn't been a cleanup of this waterway because nobody wanted to pay the kind of cost that it was going to take to pay for it. And it wasn't until BP came in with this investment, you know, it's kind of like uh, holding the community ransom with a $4.5 billion investment that they did not want to light load their barges because now the sediments were really uh, piling up, the contaminants. So now we're getting a dredge, but we're getting it for navigational purposes. Um, it, around 1980s, uh, we started deindustrializing the upper Great Lakes and the, and the EPA identified what they called 43 areas of concern. East Chicago was one of those 43, and that's the uh, Indiana Harbor Shipping Canal and the Grand Calumet River. You can see the swiggling at the bottom is Grand Calumet River. Um, what they do is they measure it based on beneficial uses. So we, we determine the quality of the waters based on how those uses are beneficial to humans. Um, and what they did, what they discovered was that of the 43 areas of concern, uh, the Indian Hammer Shipping Canal and the Grand Calumet River was considered the most uh, impaired body of water in the country. 90% of its water, uh, water flow was due to wastewater from industry and sewage. There were 150 identified leaking uh, underground storage petroleum tanks along its shores. I can go on and on. There are 
11 waste site uh, disposal facilities, five Superfund sites. It just goes on and on. It's just a tragedy. And these are the things we know. Uh, this is 1969. Uh, the uh, oil industry used to filter its systems in the water. Uh, literally, you just stick your hand in it, and you, you just come out with oil. I've been giving toxic tours for the last 10 years. Oil is bubbling up constantly. We often see dead fish floating around in the, in the waterways. Uh, this is starting to, we're getting some changes, not nearly enough, but we're beginning to get some changes with the, uh, uh, the dredging of the canal. Now, we also have another uh, uh, challenge that we have in East Chicago, and it's called a CDF. Remember I told you we couldn't dredge that canal because we couldn't put it, those sediments in the middle of Lake Michigan. They needed a site where they needed the, where they wanted to place that. And in the 1990s and early 2000s, this was probably the biggest environmental justice campaign in the United States, and still considered probably on a, te a textbook uh, uh, example. The Army Corps wanted to take those sediments and they put it in a, what's called a CDF, confined disposal facility, a manufactured uh, waste dump. And the problem is that they decided to site the CDF and it's 4.8 million cubic yards. It's the largest toxic dump in the Great Lakes uh, region. They decided to site it uh, 500, less than 500 feet from our high school and elementary school. And you can see that here in, in white at the bottom. Uh, but also, you can see all the oil uh, um, properties along this. You got BP, you have Exxon, Valero, you have Buckeye Pipeline, Kinder Morgan. This this high school is surrounded by oil and oil companies. Uh, when you have uh, a sacrifice community like East Chicago uh, and you haven't heard about it, these become toxic secrets. And when you have a community that's been sacrificed the way this community has, it has a lot to do with the environment and what we would call it e ecocide. So in the last two decades, we've had three neighborhoods that have been torn down due to contamination, due to industries that have moved uh, into their in, adjacent to their neighborhoods. We had Marktown, which was which BP just moved across the street from just three years ago. We have the Brickyard, which uh, in the mid-1990s, a company called Pollution Control Industries moved into the Brickyard. And instead of and people getting ill, instead of moving the, and regulating the industry, they decided to tear down the neighborhood and move the people out. And then just this last summer, uh, the mayor announced that he's going to be moving 12, or they've almost finished moving 1,200 people out of what's called the Calumet neighborhood. Because in the 1970s, they built a housing project on top of a lead refinery. And I'm going to be showing that. So this is the Calumet neighborhood. About one fifth of the population of East Chicago lives in a, in a lead refinery or in a Superfund site. This is a map of the uh, of the uh, EPA in terms of what they've studied, what they've tested uh, for twenty for last forty years since they built the housing complex. And the housing complex is in what we call Zone One. That's where it's all lit up in red. Zone Two is the middle. Zone Three is to the to the right. Uh, I don't even know if you see that red. Yeah, you can see it is red. So for 40 years, the e EPA has been testing these lands a a a on a kind of ad hoc random basis. Um, they tested just south of the Superfund site and they, in 1985, and they found the lead levels to be 500,000 parts per million. That is every other particle is a lead particle. So over the last 40 years, they're randomly testing and they you can see in zone one, they found 3% of the land found some high levels, not very high levels. But it wasn't until 2014 that the EPA finally did a comprehensive testing. And let me try to, to explain this. So 1990, our, in 1985, there was, a soup, there was a lead foundry just south of this Superfund site called US Lead, which is named after. It went out of business in 1985. Uh, by 1995, they built a what they call a camu. They they covered that up with uh, with 40 feet of clay, and they built a slurry wall around it. They understood that it was so contaminated that they needed to to cover it up with 40 feet of clay. But at some point, they should have been able to look over at the housing project, which was built on top of another lead refiner called Anaconda. 
and say, oh my God, something needs to happen. So this was in the early 1990s, and in fact, in the early 1990s, Indiana Department of Environmental Management was investigating to place this on the, uh, the Superfund priority list. Uh, if you remember, in the early 1990s, uh, the Superfund was well-funded. It wasn't until 1995 that, under Bill Clinton, it was not reauthorized. And by 2003, we lost our funding. It went bankrupt. The program went bankrupt. So it was never placed on the national priority list, uh, and it wasn't comprehensive tested until 2014, where when they finally tested it uh, in the housing project, they found that 97% of the land was heavily contaminated. Now, let me give you kind of an understanding how much contamination there is. And one of the problems that we faced was that somehow the EPA over 40 years of random testing did not find that 97%. They found the 3% that wasn't highly, that was contaminated, but not highly. Let me give you an understanding how high it is. Uh, 400 parts per million in a lead contamination in soil triggers a cleanup. What they found in this property, on this property, was 91,000 parts per million. They were finding lead levels in the homes of the resident at, at 32,000 parts per million. That's how high this was, and for 40 years, how, how adept they've been at not finding what they did not want to find. Um, I do think we have a, a regulatory capture situation. So this is the, the companies, the culpable parties, U.S. led to the bottom here, and then Anna, uh, this is called Griselli. Griselli located there in 1889, the same year as BP, because they, they, they sold sulfuric acid to the refinery. It eventually, in the 1920s, was bought out by DuPont, and uh, now is owned by uh, uh, Dover. So here is the Superfund site map. It's a, it's a political map based on the neighborhood. What's overlaid here is the aerial depositions, the aerial deposits of lead mapped out, modeled out across the region. So you can see the Superfund site does not match where the contaminants went. It's a, it's a political map, not, a, not one where the harm was caused. You can see it, at the top of the map there's actually a hospital and another school within the aerial deposition. At the bottom map there's another neighborhood that's, that's affected as well but they're not a part of the Superfund site, and there's no testing going on in those areas. So in August of this past year, the mayor um, uh, held a public meeting and said that he's gonna force evacuation if everybody had to leave with, within uh, uh, 90 days. Um, so what we did was we started organizing. We, got, we worked with National Nurses United. We started canvassing the community, trying to figure out their health conditions, who they were, and get them involved. We worked with Black Lives Matter as well. Uh, just as Duke, one of the things that East Chicago is you know, famous for is we have a lot of athletes, very known for their physical abilities. Duke played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Duke has uh, bone cancer. Lots of people in the community starting now to talk about their, their, their health concerns and what, what, what has been going on. Uh, what ended up happening is we had a lot of politicians come by, you know, political figures that were running for governor. We had attorneys dropping by, you know, uh, giving advice and looking for clients. We had attorneys even, you know, sending in limos into the neighborhood trying to collect people uh, in limos. Uh, but in the meantime, the EPA started to dig up the, the properties and started to clean them up. Now they're basing it, they're cleaning it up to 400 parts per million. And then remember, that's the upper limit. The CDC, even though the EPA is cleaning up to 400 parts per million, that translates to over 10 deciliters per, uh, 10 milligrams per deciliter in your blood. Uh, that's twice the, the allowable limit in your blood. So if you're, if we have kids that are are playing on this land, they're still highly uh, exposed to heavily contaminants. So one of our demands with the EPA is that we want to lower uh, the levels uh, that they have to clean up to. So throughout these last uh, nine months, they've been cleaning up individual yards, uh, digging them up. Now, they're going around all structures, all, all, all uh, shrubs, all trees. So about less than 40% less than of the land is actually getting cleaned up because it's under, under structures or, or streets or sidewalks. And in fact, about five years ago, they did a little bit, some cleanup on, on individual properties. They've retested those lands and found that they've been recontaminated. One of the problems that we face is that the water table is right at the ground level. 
So we've organized, we had to force the mayor to declare, or to request the governor to make this a disaster site. Uh, he was not willing to do that. We eventually forced him to do that. Uh, Pence uh, uh, declined. He was not going to declare a, a disaster area. It wasn't until Holcomb came into office that he finally did, that Holcomb did. We held several meetings with the mayor. We brought in uh, lead experts to bring our own experts. Three weeks ago, we brought 200 people from EJ communities like ours, from Detroit, from Flint, from Kalamazoo, from Elkhart, from Southeast Side, from West Side together, and we collapsed on the EPA with our set of demands. And uh, uh, we just received those demands today. I haven't read them, uh, the response to it. So we delivered our demands to the EPA. We've, we're asking them to you know, lower the, the, li the limits. We're asking also for homeowners to be bought, have a voluntary buyout program. Um, and, and we have a whole list of things that we're making demands. Uh, we brought, we had a conference with all EJ communities in, in our region. Uh, and then we forced Pruitt, the only first time Pruitt, and the only time Pruitt's been seen publicly. We forced him to come down to East Chicago. And we held a rally, and I was in the meeting with Pruitt, uh, and making our demands known to, to him as well. Uh, and then we went to, as I said earlier, we went to D.C. Uh, we brought, brought attention to ourselves by, by marrying this EJ issue with uh, the climate change issue. We got one of our members uh, on Democracy Now! to bring more attention to, to the issues. And, and I'm going to leave. Oh, so that's, 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 West, that's, this, that's the one neighborhood. That's uh, Calumet neighborhood. The other neighborhood that's been cannibalized by industry is Marktown. And this is Marktown, it's very similar, it's a utopian industrial village. BP in the upper right hand corner moved right across the street, now it's landlocked by industry. A month after BP moved across the street, they then sent out notices that they're going to demolish Marktown. Uh, to understand, uh, in terms of property values and understand what we face here, the medium home value in East Chicago is $55,000. The medium home value in the United States is over $220,000. We're one-fourth the medium home value country. The medium home value in these neighborhoods is about $14,000. And they're using the market to, to push these people out. And so we tried to organize the community at the time. And this was, this was a, we couldn't get an attorney, we couldn't get anybody to help. Because this was, the BP was using the market and there was no way to stop them. And they had big pockets. So at, by this time now, uh, three years later, uh, BP has torn down about 15% of Marktown. Now, Marktown was designed by Howard Van Doren Shaw based on Ebenezer Howard's concepts of Garden City, you know, and this is a walkable community. It's like an English Tudor village, uh, but it's now completely, almost, well, 15% gone. So one of the what frameworks in which uh, our corporations, uh, the EPA, and everything work under is plausible deniability. You know, we don't test what we don't want to find. And that's what we find is that we don't have the research to, 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 to benefit people. We don't have the legal expertise uh, to defend people. And so we feel there's a t clear uh, pattern here of neglect for the last uh, 40 years. And so I'm going to leave it at that. This is a, a I've got some videos here if you ever want to see it. But I'm going to leave this, uh, uh, we're going to leave a link on, online for you to go through this presentation if you want. This is actually a picture outside my window in East Chicago. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, wow. That is something. Uh, I have to say, uh, this is probably one of the, I mean, I, I'm, it's paradoxical. I use this word around here a lot, but I mean, on one level, this almost seems just beyond, I mean, it, like, what can you do with this? No one is uh, helping you. It's obvious that the only thing you can do is try to organize the people in your community around this, and then, and I'm, I'm curious about, you know, uh, what's the level of, I mean, in the, it, you would know this because, I mean, you're right in the middle of it, you're, you know, you're an activist. Um, uh, 
how, uh, how, how, how did the average person down there feel about this? I mean, is this a demoralization situation that you're confronted with? Uh, where is the, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, um, you know, it's, it's like it, look, it looks, it, it, for all practical purposes, like there's no remedy here. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm using a lawyer's term there. I don't. Anyway, uh, but in, in any event, um, like, I, I, I think, and I said this to, uh, to Tom uh, before we did this program, the, the most interesting thing I think about this is, is that, like, the idea here about organizing, uh, I, I'm, I had said to him, I went to the May Day demonstrations that we had, uh, you know, obviously on May Day, and ironically enough, I mean, I've been going to these things for so, it's like decades, right? And I have to tell you, the one takeaway that I had, May Day, Chicago, 2017, was that, you know, the official numbers that they threw out about how many people were demonstrating, they were way off, but in the other way around. I mean, normally they tell us there's, you know, uh, there's 5,000 people when there's 20. Well, guess what? There were three or four thousand people, and they said there was twenty. I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't compute that. I mean, it was just really weird. But in any event, uh, it, I think that this is like where we have to go with this. Because I had said to him, you know, I'm getting sick and tired of marching. You know, I mean, I think like what we have to have and what, how we build and organize has got to be. Yes, we can do that, but we have to have demands. I mean, there has to be a point at which we're trying to move, bring people in and move in a direction to, you know, accomplish positive things. You know, now, exactly what those things are depends on what the issues are, and this is a situation that like, looks like, I mean, I don't even know what remediation means in this, uh, given how I, you, you're talking about living in a toxic cesspool, almost. Uh, it, it reminds me of the thing uh, that the Russians had to deal with, with Chernobyl but it's not radioactive, but maybe it's even worse. It's, uh, you know, on some levels. I mean, you talk about uh, the problems with human beings co contracting cancers and all these other illnesses. I'm just gonna let it go at that, but you know, you can maybe wanna expand on that and address that point or right. you know, wherever you wanna go. Right, so I can actually double down on a lot of this. We, we have the lot highest uh, infant mortality rate in the country most of the years in East Chicago, and um, we have a lot of other issues. I mean, it's just, there are cascading effects. Our educational system is completely falling apart. We can't, uh, our ability, you know, these affect the brain and learning uh, these chemicals. Uh, so there are, there are just so many cascading effects when, you, when a polluter is allowed to pollute. Now we do have frameworks, and well, one of the major change challenges we had in trying to bring attention to this is that for a long time they've been given other metaphors, and metaphors for safety, risk, uh, benefit agreements, you know, and focusing on the benefits and not the risk and the ramifications of all these compiling risks. Also when it comes to the EPA, people don't really know that, is that when a, when a, a polluting industry wants to come into your community, when they evaluate that, they're not allowed to evaluate that based on other players in the, in this, in the community. So let's just say uh, you, got, you have 20 uh, facilities that are unpermitted because they don't quite meet the, maximum, uh, the, the minimum requirement to get a permit in terms of their releases. And so you've got 20 of them that are sitting there. As, and when you aggregate it, that's a lot. And that's what we find also that's happened. But we also have BP, Arsenal Mill, and U.S. Steel, which owns, almost owns our airshed, our watershed, and it's like property to them. And so they're going to hold on to that very close. If you move a housing project next to BP, you're impeding their value to that access to that, to that property in the airshed, because now you have, they have to lower their dis, discharges. They have ownership of a lot of, of our environmental uh, situation. Um, the main problem that we face is we almost had to mentor people on how to respond to some of this. You know, they were contaminated, highly contaminated in the Superfund site, and they didn't know how to respond because they've heard and they've lived and they move amongst this, but they didn't know. So it almost, we've almost had to mentor them with others in other communities. We had to bring other people from other communities that have faced very similar things. And that's just to start to understand what's happening to them. And, what, and to begin to face those, those realities. 
The other thing that we had, and some things that did not happen, we, you've heard of the Burnham Plan here in Chicago. Um, we developed, uh, after 30 years of uh, uh, automation and the loss of jobs, all right, so I, I told you we had 70,000 jobs in steel and steel related industries. Today we have 2,500. Uh, our biggest employer today is a casino. Uh, that's, that's, and these jobs in the industry are no longer jobs that are, 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 are held by people that live in the community. They're held by people outside the community. So we developed a, a Marquette plan. And that's kind of an extension of the Burnham plan. And basically what we did is that industry has done a lot more on a lot less property. So what they've held, they had is they've, they have all these brownfields, abandoned industrial properties. It's still a gated industrial lakefront. It's about 27 linear miles that industry owns of the lakefront. But much of that is out of use and it's considered a brownfield and it's perhaps contaminated. The Marquette plan looked to diversify and bring those lands into higher and better uses. Unfortunately, that's when BP announced its project and they decided to go with the, you know, the devil they knew, and that was industry. And so they reindustrialized. And they just, for the last 40 years, industry has been allowed to mitigate against their liabilities on those lands and use legal maneuvers to not have to address them. But we do have that framework of the Marquette plan to begin to to catalyze development by using uh, industries, in, to seed industries to do remediation and cleanup. That would be one way of going about it. Uh, we got billions of dollars of damage in, the, in just the land alone. And to start to clean that up would, would put a lot of people to work. One of the problems we face though is that, you know, industry's broken it. You know, now they need to fix it. And they really don't want to. It's, I know when you go into a store and you break something, you pay in full. But they pay just in pennies uh, on the dollar. So what we end up getting are capping projects. They cap it, and then it goes out of use. Or when they cleaned the, the they recently did the dredging and restoration of the uh, Grand Calumet River. They knew that there were ten, near, you know, between eight and ten feet of contaminated sediment that they that needed to be cleaned out. What they ended up doing is doing a contour. They just did a cleaning up contour, and they capped it. And so they've entombed those contaminants under the cap. And so what we have is kind of like a Disney set. It's like a Hollywood set where it's just facades of nature. It's a second nature, third nature. It's not real nature. It's a you know, it's a, it's a artist's rendition of nature. Uh, but if those caps crack, if they break, they have problems, it's just gonna be free into the system. So those are some of the problems that we face is we really need to have full cleanups and that would seed a lot of uh, a lot of jobs. So what we're looking to do is we're looking also to reframe the development. What we've done on the southeast side of Chicago is we, we developed a plan called the Green Economic Industrial Corridor. And that's the green, green clean jobs to the southeast side. Uh, we'd like to pull that into northwest Indiana as well, but also by using cleanup, remediation as a way to do that. Uh, the just transition framework with climate justice. The idea there is uh, we want those economic benefits to come to communities like us, frontline communities. So we want those green jobs, whether it's solar or wind, to come to East Chicago or have development there uh, before it goes out to the suburban edge. Our problem though is, is that a lot of these green jobs aren't union jobs and they can't support full families and they have a lot of problems. So we have, to, we have some challenges there. Uh, but we also, another, another framework, we, we have been praising for the last year that the Rockefellers divested of uh, fossil fuels in their, in their portfolio. Uh, and it's really wonderful that they have. Uh, and they're able to fund Naomi Klein's movie, This Changes Everything. Uh, they're able to do a lot, of, a lot of things like that, but they haven't come back to clean up that land that they used to own. And that's been allowed to just sit there. And they just carry that liability to the next buyer, to the next buyer, and we really don't get that cleaned up. And those are some of the challenges in our legal framework. Remember, that legal lawyer uh, framework, the industries are able to not only hire all the lawyers, they're able to pay all the lobbyists, they're able to pay all the, off all the, the uh, um, politicians. politicians, they're able to write all the laws. I mean, we're really, that's the reason why we get in the streets and we find other ways to escalate 
other than just, we, we, we have a diversity of tactics. We're going to go with the legal uh, avenue as well as people power, and we're going to find ways to reframe the, the story uh, through our actions, through our writings, through our videos, and stuff like that. Uh, so that's that's what we're, we're kind of doing. We're framing, when they talk about you know engineering solutions or economic solutions, we're, we're talking about justice and fairness, and we're trying to control that dialogue as much as we can. In a good response to the last question. But uh, in the 1860s, Karl Marx wrote that the when the capitalists can no longer count on their minions to provide the climate for the, the total profit of the capitalists, the capitalists take over themselves and directly control the government, which we have now. Yeah. We have several industrialists or financial capitalists running not only the country but several states. Um, apparently, the the minions in northeast India, northwest Indiana, uh, don't fit that. That that they they have gone out of their way to supervise the the capitalists and what they wanted to do. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, uh, um, we haven't been through a very good the last several decades. Uh, labor um, is almost protecting the capitalist. Um, um, they. They are, tr they are shrinking very rapidly, but ignoring the fact that they're shrinking very rapidly, and they're trying to hold on to the little that they have um, continually. Northwest Indiana, again, we had this paternal relationship with industry. Uh, industry basically took care of them, and uh, but for the last 40 years, that their fortunes decoupled, and they still are operating as if that's the case. Um, this is... You know, it's a tough thing because today there is still an argument in Northwest Indiana that when the dunes were saved, it was a federal taking of land from private owners. Well, that was going to be handed off to industry. You know, and that's a, that's a fight that people have been um, juiced up on uh, and 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 f and believe in. Um, and so we're we're beginning to change that in East Chicago with the Superfund uh, campaign. We're changing the way people are looking at how they look at the story. Um, and one of the things that's really helping us is, is having them communicate to other communities and hearing what they're doing. What's happened is we're, we have a very insular uh, political economy in East Chicago. Everybody gets what they can through the mayor. We have a, we have a strong mayor system. And so the mayor you know, gives them jobs, gives them projects, gives them lots of things. Um, when we start to talk to like uh, organizers in Detroit, which has a long history of movement building, uh, and they also have a strong history and strong movement of culture organizing, uh, that's something we don't have in Northwest Indiana. You have a little bit of it in Chicago. You have a long history of organizing in Chicago as well, but we don't have it in East Chicago in terms of the community. So those are the kinds of things we're starting to build up. We've, we've been working with the Poor People's Campaign and uh, uh, getting our community linked in with other communities. So they're not left alone. One of the things that industry loved to do, what the mayor did the day he announced the, uh, the, the, uh, the forced evacuations, he announced that he was the giver of blessings and that no, don't listen to the outsiders. An outsider came and got, tried to get to the mic and there was an outsider that lived in the Superfund site. He actually ex asked the, 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 the police to come and escort him out. You know, he didn't want anybody else to take their blessings away. And that was how he defined it. And because he was the giver of blessings. And what he tried to do is privilege the, those who have been harmed. And he acted as if we're privileging you. Don't let these outsiders, you know, hurt you. You know, they're going to come in and try to do things. And that was the last thing. But it left the community for a long time was confused and isolated. And the mayor can do what he can and wants by them. And that was to disperse them. He wanted to just, he said, you can go anywhere in America. I'll send you anywhere. Well, that wasn't the case. One of the first things that we had to do, and it was our lawyers that were fighting us on this, we, they, they, the mayor was requiring them to continue to pay their rent while they were being poisoned. And we kept saying, no, you don't pay to be poisoned. And the attorney said, well, they have to, because you know, otherwise they'll lose their vouchers and this and that, so they're gonna have to. So as activists, as organizers, we were able to get the community to make that as a, as a front 
demand is they're no longer going to pay pay to be poisoned. So the last six months they haven't been paid. You know they haven't been paying, uh, and so we've had to continue the fight with for everything. You know along the way, it's you know every day is another challenge and another tactic that the that the city would take or that HUD would take or the federal government would take. You know those we what we. What we discovered in the situation, I'm more of an environmental ass activist, and what I discovered in the situation was that I wanted to go in there and address the environmental issues, but there were all these social and economic ramifications. I couldn't just isolate that. And they were being harmed. The housing authority was just, we just were shocked in, in the brutal behavior and intimidation uh, on these people. We had several people that went homeless for several weeks. They were relocated force relocated to other housing authorities where there was no no there was not a, a unit for them so they had to, to port back and then it took them several weeks to be allowed to come back and because they you know the the, the landlord that they ported out to wasn't returning the, their deposits so now suddenly we got a, a, a string of people that are homeless and so we there were so many things I mean I, I it's it's atrocious we had issues with the you know, getting blood testing. Uh, we had residents that that had been had their children tested. It took them over a year for the health department to get those results to the resident, and those blood levels were huge, way over over the limit, allowable limit. And so they, over the time, they allowed their kids to continue to play in the soil, not knowing, and uh, because they didn't have the data. So we had to address that, and then we had issues where there was. You know, finger pointing, one agency uh, blaming another agency, and we had to come in and solve those problems. One agency, the city, wanted to control the blood testing. Well, it turns out, and they did, they got control of it, and the state wanted the you know, health department, wanted them to have control. But it turns out they lost their grant three or five years ago and didn't have the money to do it. So we ended up having to step in every one of these situations, and I can't tell you how crazy it, it ended up getting. Well, you've ruined my view of the world. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, you mentioned Paul Douglas. He was a senator, U.S. senator yeah. from Illinois. Uh, and he was I call the, him congressman, that's right. Yeah, yeah right. He, uh, he was one of the good ones, really good ones. He was a uh, professor uh, in economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, resigned, or quit, and went joined the Marines during World War II and came back, and he, and he did save the dunes. Um, I, want, I did want to ask you, before you got into it, the uh, local politics of East Chicago. Uh, how is the mayor, is he like the tool of, of how is he chosen? I think you mentioned that only 17% of the land area is residential. Right. So uh, what's the population? And then you mentioned the new governor of uh, Indiana is Holcomb. Holcomb. What is... Uh, all right, talk a little bit about yeah, what can, the uh, state does. Yeah, I can, I can tell you the political framework. So East Chicago, all right. This is going to be a wrap up now. Okay, we're almost at five yeah. minutes. All right, so really quickly, East Chicago has a long history of political corruption. Uh, during the, from the 70s to, the, to 2004, we had one mayor for 32 years. Uh, he was a boss mayor, uh, you know, modeled after Daley, worked very closely with Daley, worked very, very closely with the Clintons. His son was the uh, national treasurer for the National Democratic Party during the 90s. He also became uh, the chief uh, consultant to Hillary Clinton's campaign for president. Uh, they're very well connected, and that was Pastrick. Um, they had a pretty much a criminal enterprise. and. Uh, he had lost in the early 2000s, and the new mayor, Mayor Pabe, um, had a lot of problems. He was kind of what we call a cartoon uh, version of, of Mayor Pastrick, the previous mayor. Um, and he ended up in federal prison, and his staff uh, went into federal prison. There's a, there's a great documentary, uh, the 2000 election uh, between Pabe and Pastrick and it's called King of Steel Town, and it talks about, it, it shows the, uh, the 2000 election. This, the mayor was able to take $20 million and do private, it's called a sidewalk scandal, and do new, new concrete projects on private property and, uh, and stuff. He, every, all of his staff ended up in federal, over 20 people ended up in federal prison, but he didn't. Um, he just passed away this last year. 
But this mayor um, um, was kind of appointed by the, the precinct system. And uh, when he was, when he won, the old mayor, Pastor, came out and kind of blessed him and handed off all of his resources. What he did is he, he withheld his network from the from the mayor of Pabé, uh, and Pabé was just bankrupt as, as a mayor, and nothing was happening. So now we have Mayor Copeland, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, old Pastrick regime has been supporting that. So projects are moving forward, but they're all private-public partnerships, and selling off of our public assets uh, to these corporations. Are, one of the things I didn't share with you, one of the things that we forced the EPA to do was to clean up I was to, to test the waters. We, in, in the Superfund site, uh, we wanted to address all the uh, pathways that lead had uh, to contaminate, you know, to, to affect the residents. EPA kept saying, no, no, it's only in the soil, it's only in the soil. We finally forced them to test the water, and we discovered that 90% of the, our water is heavily contaminated. We can't drink water in East Chicago anymore, by the way. So in the last four months, we've been supplying our own water, doing water drives to people uh, in East Chicago. Um, so, in the, when it comes to the politics downstate, Mayor Pastrick, uh, his, his godson was Evan Bayh, and uh, Evan Bayh was governor of Indiana for a while before he became a senator. That's that whole network, and it has what East Chicago represents, the way where they extracted their wealth to feed projects uh, and campaigns across the country. We have Governor Holcomb who kind of come, came in under Pence, who came in under um, uh, Daniels. Mitch Daniels was the uh, budget director under George Bush. He then became governor of Indiana. Uh, and now he's the president of uh, Purdue University. And they're now trying to merge Purdue University with Kaplan College, a for-profit education company. Uh, Pence, people may not know this, but Pence, his family used to own an oil company, Kyle Oil. They, they had a major, several major uh, uh, fences and owed the state of Indiana $8 million for oil spills. Well, instead of paying those fines, they ended up just declaring bankruptcy uh, and uh, getting out from underneath those fines. And Daniels was the governor at the time, and he, he appointed Mike Pence's brother as number two in IDEM, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. And he was, he was uh, called the efficiency czar. He was so efficient, he, he only had to work for three months and then he moved on. And it appears that a lot of documents went missing during that period. Um, so now we got Holcomb and it's a brand new governor. We don't know what's happening right now. He, what he has done so far is he actually allowed, he has declared uh, an emergency here. And then he has ex offered us an extension on that declaration. Now, what he's the only funds that he's provided us was funds to relocate people and to demolish the housing complex. But he hasn't given us funds to make these people whole, hasn't in, in, to replace all their furnishings, or uh, to help them in any real manageable way. One of the things he's just recently done is they've just the, the Democrat or Republicans downstate have just uh, wiped out. Uh, most of our precinct system. So they've, they're consolidating all the precincts in Northwest Indiana, and that will have a ramification on uh, voters. It's a, a tactic, voter suppression tactic, because this is a community of color. It's also a Democratic stronghold. The Republicans control most of the state. So there's, there's always those kinds of polls. Okay, that gets that wraps up. Thank you.